Alex here with part 177 of the My Docket series on child custody and visitation. As in our previous videos, we'll take this opportunity to direct our viewers to part zero if you haven't seen it yet. That's a video that contains the detailed disclaimers and the underlying purpose of the series. Two things that I will glaze over are, number one, I'm not in the middle of this right now. My case is completely and totally over. It's closed. It cannot be reopened. And that's because my ex's parental rights have been terminated. Number two, the nutshell version as to the purpose of the series is to give my viewers one big example of my eight-year-long high-conflict child custody ordeal from beginning to end in chronological order. We go back to the civil writ petition case under CB 13-0109. The order reversing and remanding also landed in this case, actually only landed in this case. This is not, what was I thinking of? Maybe the order of recusals, which landed in both cases. Sorry about that, guys. What I meant to say is that the order of reversal and remand has landed in this case, and we are now up to the point where the new judge, District Judge Bridget Robb, has um, amended the um, other judge, previous judge, District Judge Chuck Weller's erroneous order denying my motion for costs. So District Judge Chuck... Uh, um, Bridget Robb has replaced or amended his order with an order that grants my award of costs. This is not really anything more than a technical video, I suppose you could, I don't even think, yeah, that the, this video is purely technical, It'll probably be very short as well. My mindset actually, I can remember, believe it or not, was pretty positive, and that is because not so much of this case, but the other case. At the time that the judge got the order of reversal and remand from the Court of Appeals, we hadn't had our hearing yet on um, the relocation hearing that you guys have seen, the, the hearing video. The timeline in these two different cases is not quite consistent, but at the time, this was something that I can remember very clearly. I thought I am very glad that at this point in time that order reversing came down because my new judge is going to know that I know how to use the Court of Appeals. And it was really important to me that my new judge follow the law. So even though this order was not an order that she screwed up, I thought it was going to be very helpful to me going into that hearing because I thought I'm going to stand out. She's got thousands of cases. I'm going to stand out as the person who represented himself on appeal and won. Now, it doesn't matter. She still screws up two times on her own. But... I didn't know that that would happen at the time. My mindset was positive because I thought she would see this and she would go, okay, let's follow the law in this case. And it didn't happen the way that I expected, but I didn't know that back then. And so, I mean, the, the, this portion of the video has to talk about my mindset and how I felt at the time. And I remember feeling very buoyed by not just the order reversing and remanding, but also the timing at which that order came down. So all that being said, let's go ahead and take a look at what my judge has filed. Here we have the judge's amended order after reversal and remand. So standard introductory paragraph. On March 3rd, 2015, the Nevada Court of Appeals found that District Judge Chuck Weller erred in denying my motion for costs. On March 24, 2015, this court entered its order after reversal and remand. The Supreme Court remitted her. It was filed on April 23rd, 2015. I filed a motion to renew order after remand and consolidate costs on July 17th, 2015. Uh, this motion was submitted unopposed on August 5th, and the court now finds an orders as follows. Hey guys, I'm kind of confused here. I'm not sure that I went over those filings. I'm not going to go back in time and take a look because we need to keep moving forward in the My Docket series, and these filings are very unimportant. They are purely technical. I'm going to go ahead and give you guys a brief summary, just in case one of two things happen. Number one, I somehow skipped them, which is, I highly doubt that I did. Number two, which is more likely, is that the court removed the previous order from the docket. I suppose that's possible because the order after reversal and remand that she entered on March 24, 2015 was erroneous. 
but she wasn't supposed to do that because the remitter hadn't issued yet. Um, and so that order would have been void ab initio. In Latin, it means from the start. That was an order with no enforceability. It was, um, you know, I can't underline the importance of understanding subject matter jurisdiction. When a court enters orders in violation of its subject matter jurisdiction, it's a serious issue because that is an order that is completely ignored at any point in time that somebody brings it up. It is something that even the Supreme Court of Nevada will consider, even if you violate all of the other principles. If you fail to uh, raise it at, you know, in the lower court, if you never even object to it, they don't care. You can come back 10 years later and object to it and just like that, it's gone. So please watch my video on the topic subject matter jurisdiction. Please watch my video on the topic jurisdiction divested on appeal because this judge, my new judge, messed up when she entered the order after reversal and remand and you know without waiting for the remitter to come down um, if you watch those two videos you'll understand more as to why all of this matters i think a lot of non-attorneys think who cares a judge is a judge is a judge whatever they say goes period and it's not how the government sees it and it's not how the supreme court sees it a judge has to act within the boundaries of the power they've been given and when a judge oversteps those boundaries their orders are meaningless and um, this is what happened in this case. So I hope that I went over those filings and I just can't remember because it was too long ago. I don't like the idea of having missed them, but they're so unimportant and they're so technical that even if I did miss them, I'm just going to move on. Um, in fact, if somebody watching the My Docket series can remember, feel free to post down in the comments below. Hey, Alex, I remember you going over these way back when. And just let me know. Um, I just have so many things to do that I can't even go back and look at my own series because I just have to get all these things done in one day and I don't have enough time. So anyway, this judge at this point in time right now has decided to enter the same order again, only this time it is a valid enforceable order because the remitter has issued. As you can see, the remitter was received by this court on April 23rd, 2015. And so this order at this point right now is enforceable. I'm seeking an award of costs against my ex as a result of the district court granting my writ of mandamus, directing the government to disclose her confidential address to me. In addition to my motion for costs, I am, have filed a memorandum of costs. Specifically, the memorandum indicates that I paid postage copies um, for a total of $47.56, and I was also granted an additional $7.83 in costs by the Supreme Court. Um, if you want to learn more about costs and attorney fees, please watch my video on the topic costs and attorney fees. If you want to learn more about writ petitions, which is what a writ of mandamus, well, the, the process of getting a writ of mandamus involves filing a petition. If you want to learn more about what that is, please watch my video on the topic writ petitions. And if you want an over arching um, general review of what this dispute was about, please watch my video on the topic um, right to know where a child resides. Right to know where a child resides. That's correct. Conclusions of law. Costs must be allowed to the prevailing party and against any adverse party against whom judgment is entered in a special proceeding. The statute is 18.020 subsection 4. The Nevada provides that costs, quote unquote, include reasonable costs for photocopies and postage and the, and the judge cites another statute my request for costs is granted and i shall be awarded those costs right now certificate of service under rule 5 this indicates that the uh, judge served both my attorney and my ex interestingly oh she did serve the government okay so she served all of us oh wait i didn't have an attorney in this case sorry guys i got confused there she served both me and my ex and then she also served the government's lawyer um, I'm filing a request for submission on the motion to renew order after remand and consolidate costs. So this is, um, slightly out of order. This request for submission would have been filed first and then the judge's amended order would have come after. In fact, if you look at the dates, they are correct. The reason I put them out of order is because I like for the primary document to be the, do the document that's actually not only first, but the one that is highlighted in the video. So I, I kind of flip these around, but this request for submission would have come first and then the amended order would have come second. This, um, you can learn more about the request for submission if you go and find and watch my video on the topic, request for submission. Uh, what else were we looking at here? Uh, Rule 5, Certificate of Service. This is um, indicating that I mailed this document to both the government's lawyer and my ex. By the way, what is this? So this is submitting the motion to renew order. And in this motion, I let the judge know that she um, was not supposed to. At the, you know, this is kind of coming back to me. 
I'm kind of thinking I did go over this, but this is the motion that explains to the court that she um, violated um, her subject matter jurisdictional boundaries by entering that order without the remitted or having issued. Uh, substitution of attorney. This is the government swapping its attorneys out. If you want to learn more about what this is, please, please watch my video on the topic, removing an attorney. And um, basically, the attorney who's on the case, a, a senior deputy, I think it's Kevin Benson, I'm pretty sure it's Kevin Benson, is replacing himself with the other uh, senior deputy, and her name is Lori M. Story. So she's taking over this case. Nothing's going to happen because the government isn't in the crosshairs. They're just kind of watching because they're in the caption and they have to watch what's going on. And yeah, so this is a, a pretty standard substitution of counsel. The nice thing about a substitution of counsel is you don't need approval from the judge. You can just take one lawyer and swap them out for the other, just like that. Ooh, no, that's right, that's right. It should have Kevin Benson's signature on it. It's odd that it doesn't. Normally, that's required under the rules of civil procedure. Maybe it's different for the government. Maybe because they're both government lawyers, maybe they don't have to have both signatures on there. But in, in you, ordinarily, they, they need to both be there. Um, and then we have the certificate of service under Rule 5 indicating that the substitution of counsel was mailed to both me and my ex and her attorney. I don't know why they did that because she hasn't made... I don't think she's made any appearances at all in this case. Not a single one. Weird. Um, then we have the notice of entry of order. And this is me just indicating to my ex that her time limit to appeal starts now. If you want to learn more about the notice of entry of order, please watch my video on the topic, notice of entry of order. We have rule five certificate of service indicating I mailed this notice to both the government's lawyer and my ex. Going into the aftermath, I filed, it looks like one, two documents. They were free filing, so I incurred zero dollars in costs. My ex didn't file anything, so she incurred zero dollars in costs. I didn't have an attorney, so I incurred zero dollars in attorney fees. My ex also didn't have an attorney. Um, she didn't do anything at all in this case, nothing. She didn't even lift a pinky finger to show up at the hearing. So she incurred zero dollars in attorney fees. The government's lawyer filed uh, one document, but it's a free filing, so the government incurred zero dollars in costs. And the government's attorney would have had to prepare the substitution of counsel and review the other documents. Now, they know at this point in time that nothing is going on in this case that concerns them. And so I'm not gonna really say that it's going to take them more than 15 minutes in time. And at the rate of $250 an hour, that's going to cost the government $62.50 in attorney fees. As for my previous videos, if you have any questions, feel free to post them down in the comments below. And I will see you guys next time.